In the range of Chris's art, wildlife has played a central role. His attraction to the subject stems from a long interest in the spirit of the natural world and the animals that inhabit it. You know, wildlife excites me. I mean, uh, I live in a state that it's abundant with. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I want to sculpt things that are beautiful. Uh, I want to sculpt things that have life, that are full of, full of, you know, full of being alive, I guess. You know? It's hard to articulate exactly why you do things. You know, I, I have a, I feel that there's a great deal of intuition in, in the things that I do. I don't know, I always know why I pick a certain subject matter, but I do know that it has to excite me. If, if the subject matter can't excite me, then, then I'm not going to be able to do my best. In it. Working from life is the best, you know, and, and it's really hard to work from life because, especially when you're working with wildlife subject matter, it's hard to find animals that you can be around and get close to and feel. And I, and I try to grab all the subject matter I can. You know, I, working in the vein art that I do, that it's, it, the anatomy is very important. I mean, I want a good design. I think a good sculpture is a good sculpture before you put any detail into it. The design and the composition is the strong points of the sculpture. And if, if you've got a good design and good composition, and then you can put it anatomically correctly together. It just enhances the piece more. Because it's a form of communication. And you're able to speak more. You're able to tell more. But you can do it with, with the, everything anatomically correct also. I mean, horse people are very, very knowledgeable about what a horse looks like. And you want to make that horse have life and be a great design and composition. Another aspect of Chris's work is his humor. The light, the whimsical, things that keep the spirit up, if only because they are unpredictable. I have a sense of humor. I, you know, I don't try to take myself too seriously really, a lot of times. you know. And uh, uh, I've done that with several pieces, like uh, I'm not going swimming. Piece, you know, that it's, it's something that happened in nature. And most of my humorous pieces deal with nature. And uh, it seems like I have bears in the themes a lot of times. I think bears are just kind of, they just kind of lend themselves to, as a humor figure, you know. And while, you know, I've done like uh, Loaded for Bear, and Trail Boss, you know, these other sculptures that, you know, I, what you want to do is sometimes you want to bring out, what, what I want to do in a viewer is bring out some kind of emotion. I mean, art, art is just a form of communication. And I'm trying to say something, and I hope the viewer can hear what I'm trying to say. Another integral part of Chris's work is casting the bronze, an art in itself. This is where the clay or wax model is transformed into permanent bronze. This process involves many steps and hours. There are a number of casting techniques, but the one Chris uses for his work is called the lost wax method an ancient form with a tradition that extends back thousands of years and is capable of exquisitely capturing the finest details of a work of art. The casting process begins with making a soft mold of the original sculpture that minutely captures every nuance the artist has put into it. This soft mold is then encased and held in a hard plaster or fiberglass form called the mother mold, and once made, the original sculpture is no longer needed in the process. Into this mother mold, molten wax is poured to make a hollow wax replica of the original sculpture. When cooled, this near perfect image can be further worked by the artist, either to make minor corrections or major changes. One of these must be made for each casting of the original sculpture. To each wax model, a master craftsman attaches wax rods at key points which will later serve as channels for the molten bronze to flow into the mold and allow air to escape as it fills with metal. The next step in the process calls for the wax copy to be encased in a hard ceramic shell. This is accomplished by dipping the model into a thick liquid slurry and dusted with fine heat-resistant sand or stucco. This process is repeated six to ten times until a thick casing is developed 
that can withstand the intensity and pressures of casting the molten metal. This ceramic shell is itself baked in a special kiln at some 1800 degrees. It is in this heating process that the wax model melts and is lost, hence the term lost wax method. Remaining inside, however, is the perfect impression of the original wax model. The now ready ceramic shell is placed into a bed of sand for support for when the bronze is poured into it. The molten bronze is heated in a crucible to upward of 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, out of which it is immediately poured down the now open channels that flow into the empty mold, filling it to the brim with glowing bronze. Left to cool, when ready, the ceramic shell can begin to be broken away. In fact, it already started cracking in the cooling process. Sandblasting is then used to remove all final traces of the shell from the now hard bronze sculpture. And it is also at this stage that if a bronze is cast in separate pieces, it is welded together. The surface of the bronze is carefully inspected, and in a process called chasing, work is done with a variety of handheld grinders, welders, and tools that bring the piece into a form that matches the original as closely as possible. The final step in the foundry is creating the patina, or coloring, on the surface of the bronze. Various chemicals and methods are used to create a variety of effects, from the subtle to the dramatic. The chemicals accelerate and control effects that might otherwise take centuries to achieve. As a finishing touch, a base is often put on the sculpture before it leaves the foundry. Because of the extensive amount of work done by hand to each piece, each bronze addition will be slightly unique. Through his practical experience and genuine enthusiasm, Chris has developed an outlook on his art and life that is reflected in his work, from dramatic moments, danger, humor, or just simply caring. The range is well covered and also still growing. I feel like art's a lot like music. You know, I think art speaks to you in a certain way, just as music does. You don't need uh, someone to analyze it for you to make you realize what you like and what you don't like. I like. Uh, certain music and I don't I don't analyze why I like it so much as the rhythm, the beat. And the I believe lyrics. when people view art, that's how, how that's how I view art. And the and the great artists that have, have inspired me, I mean there's Fraser for Western art. There's been some great American sculptors, uh, Chester French. Carpo, he did some beautiful sculptures. Donatello, the great Renaissance artist. And I think, you know, I'm, I really don't believe that I'm uh, self-taught. I mean, I've learned from, uh, from everything. Sometimes I learn from books. I've learned from other artists. And I've learned from sculptors. I don't believe that there is an artist who's truly self-taught. You know, the question I get asked the most when I'm working on a sculpture is, well, how long did that take? And I, I, I tell people the same. I never keep track of how many hours or days or weeks or months that I spend on a piece. Sometimes I can spend, I'll set a piece aside for a year in my studio just to be able to look at it. Because I, I, I never really, really know when a piece is going to be done. Usually a piece is done is when it's the best that I can do and I can't make it any better than what it is. So I never keep track of the time that's put into them. Because they're kind of done when they're done. They're not done any sooner and they're not done any later. In addition to his dedication as an artist, Chris has a wide variety of seemingly diverse interests. Growing up in an Air Force family, Chris has long had a love of flying, and presently has his pilot's license and a small plane, which he uses extensively in his travels in the Rocky Mountain West. In fact, I, I have my own pilot's license, and I have a small airplane, and I fly it around, and it gives you a different perspective of, uh, of everything. And, it, and I, you know, it makes me feel good about being up in the air and flying around, going to New Horizons, and, and I enjoy it a great deal. My background was all aviators. I have three older brothers, all flyers, and my dad was in the Air Force. He was a flyer, too. And, and the thing about it is, uh, you know, I didn't come from a ranching background at all. But I just wanted to be a cowboy at first. I don't know exactly what 
something spoke to me about it. Something made me feel good about it. So that's the vein that I went off into. You know, cowboy and rodeo, and it's, it's always been a big part of my life. In fact, uh, I still love doing it today. I, I compete in team roping, today, you know, now in rodeo. My family's real important to me. You know, my wife, Lynn, my son, uh, JC, and my daughter, Natalie, uh, they're the biggest influences in my life. You know, they've inspired me a lot. In fact, uh, when I first uh, started to become a professional artist, JC was uh, just nine months old and uh, Natalie was right behind him. So uh, I've kind of watched those two grow up and they've kind of uh, gone along right along with my art career. You know, I think I've matured as an artist and they've matured into young adults and it's, you know, it's been worthwhile watching it, everything unfold the way it has. I, I'm real fortunate. I, I get to have a, you know, a family I really love and a career that's been so uh, fulfilling and rewarding to me. You know, being an artist is, a, it's been a great, great experience for me. And I think it's, it's made me more aware of everything. It's made me more of an observer of life. And not only has it challenged me intellectually, but it, it's challenged me as a person to to realize that I'm able to do something <clears throat> about things. I'm able to to change people's perceptions on some issues, you know. And I hope that, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, it's a positive influence. Chris's art is his life, and he believes it's as much a part of him as his heart. Just as early men, thousands of years ago, made images on cave walls that I believe we all have an inherited need to want to express ourselves. And one of the reasons I became an artist is to show who I am and what I believe. I want my work to reach out and touch others because in the end, really, the most worthwhile thing in art is to see what's in someone else's heart. Ha <laughs> ha!